At this point, I would like to invite on the stage Michelle Addington. Michelle is a Heinz Professor of Sustainable Architectural Design at Yale University and part of the Yale Climate and Energy Institute. As both architect and engineer, Michelle's research and teaching is focused on exploring energy systems, new technologies, and advanced materials, representing a crucial exchange between environmental and technological systems. Before studying architecture, Michelle was a design engineer and manufacturing supervisor at DuPont and began her career at NASA, where she developed structural data for composite materials and design components for unmanned spacecraft. And I think this background has given her an exceptional opportunity as an architect to extend our understanding of how we can directly, discreetly, and transiently control phenomena. Today she's here to speak about data and its discontents or discontents and how to navigate an uncertain world where information more often than not trumps knowledge. Michelle? Thanks very much. I'm absolutely delighted to be here today. Uh, I think this is an incredible organization and I'm sort of dismayed that I haven't had a, an opportunity to participate before, so I'm hoping this will be a start of a long-term relationship uh, with smart geometry. Uh, what I wanted to talk to you about today is going to cross over a few different areas. And before I start, is there any way I can get the light out of my eye? <laughs> no? Okay. Perhaps I can, I can stand over here a little bit. Um, the, uh, a few years ago, um, I was invited to give a talk at the, uh, I think, okay, now I've got it, sorry. Um, a few years ago, I was invited to give a talk at the uh, climate negotiations that were taking place in Cancun, Mexico. And one of the things that really surprised me about being at these negotiations uh, were, was the fact that there were no sessions, with the exception of two out of over 200, devoted to buildings, devoted to uh, the built environment. Uh, be, beyond that, I was also very surprised that the number of people I spoke with all were very surprised that an architect would be there. And matter of fact, uh, many of them said, well, why on earth would an architect be here? What does this have to do about architecture? And I found that a very interesting comment because one of the slides that was shown uh, was this slide right here, uh, talking about the fact that uh, architecture buildings, as we know, uh, not only have the lion's share of responsibility for a lot of the climate crisis that we deal with, uh, but it's also the place that they've identified as having the best opportunity or best chance to actually make a difference. And this was, was well accepted uh, all the way through that buildings were the answer, they were the problem, they were also where the answer lied, but for some reason it wasn't worth talking about. It wasn't worth having sessions devoted to it, it wasn't part of the negotiations, it wasn't even something they thought architects should be attending. And so I began to realize in, in going through this and sort of having the conversations, going back and looking at where did this type of opinion come from that in spite of the fact that everyone agreed that buildings were the problem, where did it come from that no one thought we needed to talk about it? And so I started looking at a lot of the documentation that was out there. And what I started to notice, whether it was coming from uh, the United Nations, uh, this particular statement that 30 to 50 percent of the technologies that we could use to make an improvement are indeed known, uh, comes from the White House, 30 to 50 percent, uh, you know, can be reduced by using these known technologies, uh, National Institute of Standards and Technology, 30 to 50 percent uh, can be done, we can reduce consumption, known technologies. Um, you go to India, the numbers change a little bit. They go to 25 to 40 from, from the 30 to 50. And in going through this, I thought this is a little startling to me that this 30 to 50 percent number has made it into policy. It's made it into a number of policy documents, uh, not only in the U.S., but worldwide. And this includes the European Union. Uh, many of the documents use this 30 to 50 percent number. And the thing is, uh, you know, as much as I've worked in this field, I could not begin to identify for you the technologies or systems that would get you this 30 to 50 percent. And so I did a paper trail of all of these different documents. 
And one of the things that I discovered at the end of the paper trail is that if you followed it all the way through, what it came back to was a 1992 study of 11 buildings in Southern California, looking at very particular technologies in a very particular suburban building type uh, that was uh, typical of that area. You know, the, no one was disingenuous with this data. No one was disingenuous with the information. It's just that each time it was cited, less of it was cited as a 1992 study of 11 buildings. Instead, just parts of it get cited. And by the time 10 years goes by, it's no longer a single study, it's a fact. And this, of course, is something that we have to deal with quite extensively in our field, is a lot of the information that we deal with, which is recorded as fact, is presented as fact, uh, indeed is not, in, uh, not fact at all. It, it's one specific study or one specific item that comes through. I find it really interesting in teaching technology uh, in architecture that when it comes to technology, people rarely cite sources. Uh, it's almost automatically assumed that if they're dealing with something that deals with science or technology, that it is indeed fact. Uh, one would certainly cite the source of a historical document. Uh, one would cite the source of, of something dealing with theory, but people never seem to think that they need to cite the source of something that deals with technology. And just as a little quick anecdote on the side of this, a few years ago I was on the jury for the top ten green buildings in the United States, and uh, one of the briefs for one of the buildings uh, talked about how much energy it received from uh, its wind turbine. Uh, it was a building that I'd actually spoken at the dedication ceremony a few months before. The wind turbine had been turned down by the community and was never installed. It was just information that was left in the original brief, but again, no one going back to sort of check that, it became something that instead of being part of an original brief, became the fact of the building and therefore moves into precedent studies and analyses as uh, something that exists or something that's saving energy when indeed it was never installed. So, you know, one of the things to, to be thinking about as, as we look at this is that all of this data that's out there, all of this information that's out there um, has been rapidly making it into not just policy, uh, we see it uh, very, very dramatically changing the code landscape in the United States, uh, you know, people often lament that we don't have enough codes uh, to deal with environmental or energy performance. The reality is, is that there's been no type of building code that's turned over more quickly and have been adopted more quickly than energy codes have been. So these energy codes are rapidly turning over, rapidly adopting what they think these best technologies are. Of course, this is what goes into different types of rating systems, uh, regardless of, of, of what their name is, are also trying to embed into practice what some of these 30 to 50 percent uh, technologies might be that are going to make a, a big difference. And then I sort of share with you uh, something uh, that came from the Department of Energy when they were trying to develop a design advisor to help people select uh, technologies from this, this list. Um, if you follow, and it's a little hard to see on this, but if you sort of follow the logic on this, what happens if you apply the design advisor, the design advisor which would tell you or direct you toward making the correct solutions, what you would end up with would be a very deep floor plate, one story building with a very thick opaque envelope. Basically all buildings should be IKEA according to this type of thing. But the idea of that is that, you know, one of the measures has to be, you know, incredible amount of insulation that demands opacity. Uh, and, and then sort of a, a, a maximum volume per uh, a perimeter envelope, which is what gives you the deep floor plate. Uh, it has to be one story because the only way you can get daylighting in now is with solar tubes. So by the time you sort of ratchet in all of these different requirements, this is the deterministic result that one begins to end up with. So the question that comes from all of this is that if these 30 to 50 percent or these technologies that can reduce 30 to 50 percent really do exist, is the problem one of will? Uh, and again, many people outside of the field of architecture really believe it is an issue of will, it's an issue of desire. Um, I had a long conversation with, um, uh, with uh, 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 John Holdren, who is Obama's energy czar, and, you know, his response to me is that almost everything that we're dealing with uh, in climate and energy is difficult, with the exception of buildings. Uh, you know, you guys know what you need to do. 
You just choose not to do it. And that was the attitude of the energy czar. So the question really is, is how effective have these approaches been when they've been applied? So if we look at the most comprehensive study of buildings that we have in the U.S., it's a collection uh, that the Department of Energy maintains, uh, redoes every two years of, of both commercial and residential buildings. This is a particular one of the commercial building survey, looking at over four million buildings, categorized by every possible way you can imagine them being categorized, uh, you know, from, from age to uh, uh, structural system uh, to location, but also whether it has shift workers working in it, whether it's a nine to five type of operation, what they're doing within it, categorized in all these different ways. And if you look at this data, a variety of things show up. The first is that buildings uh, reporting energy efficient features used more energy per capita than buildings that didn't have those. It didn't matter what the energy efficient feature was, uh, ones that we know should be making a difference, particularly things like economizer cycles uh, and uh, occupancy sensors. We know those should make a difference, and yet uh, buildings that had those used more energy. And it didn't matter when you looked at it. It was true uh, on almost every time this survey has been done. And so the questions that emerge from that is if it's not these independent technologies that are making the difference, what is going on? And of course, the, the answers are well known and they're very obvious. I mean, things that we all know and we, we all take uh, quite for granted. Uh, the first uh, that we know is that buildings are becoming much larger uh, square meters per capita and per function. Uh, it's pretty much leveled out in the U.S. Uh, we've seen in China uh, a near six-fold increase in 20 years in urban area uh, per resident. Of course, we're going to continue to see that rise as well. India is our next place where we're going to see a dramatic increase in interior space per person. The real issue here behind this is that because we depend upon ambient systems, by ambient systems we're looking at things to be relatively homogeneous in the environment, homogeneous air conditions, a very homogeneous even level of lighting, uh, the ambient environmental systems HVAC increased by the cube with an increase in dimension. Lighting systems should increase by the square, but because we're raising our ceilings, lighting systems are going up by the cube as well. We can do lots of things with uh, different types of discrete technologies, but many of these discrete technologies and material choices that we're making that are part of that 30 to 50 percent are dealing with fractional or marginal improvements when we're making changes that affect things by the square and by the cube. Of course, the other thing that we know, and it's been very problematic, uh, is the fact that electric, electric loads in buildings have increased dramatically over about a 20-year uh, time period, uh, not just from all the electrical equipment uh, that we've brought into buildings, uh, but also because um, buildings have shifted over into using um, uh, you know, a high degree of cooling which demands electricity. Uh, but interestingly enough, we're also seeing lighting requirements go up in buildings. So as we might be spending a great deal of time or attention in trying to get everyone to replace each individual lamp, but at the same time we're requiring more and more lamps uh, to be installed or inspecting more and more lamps to be installed. So we have all these increasing and one of the difficulties uh, for us uh, in this field is that this all gets collapsed into the common building metric. The common building metric looks at energy per square meter or energy per square foot, um, and it collapses these things into it. And so the um, uh, sort of dis disconcerting part of this is that if you make your building larger, it will have a better metric. Uh, it will have a lower energy per square meter because you're, you're spreading out occupant loads over a large area. The fastest way to make a building look green and have a great green metric is simply to put an atrium in it. Anything that gets rid of people really helps a building have a great metric. So somewhat problematic from that standpoint. But the other thing is that, and you'll find this embedded in codes um, both in Europe and the U.S., uh, this over-focus on heating. Heating's easy. Heating's really simple. The fact that we don't manage it well is a, is a problem that we need to address in terms of understanding how heat behaves. Cooling is not. Uh, and the thing is primary energy for cooling going up at a much faster rate than the energy spent on heating, yet all of our building codes think that heating is a problem. Much of the approach 
thinks that heating is a problem. The focus on insulation and envelopes is very much focused on dealing with heating, really doesn't address uh, the, the real issues of cooling and trying to dump heat from a building particularly well. So these are not anything that are news to anyone. Everybody knows that these things are so. Everybody recognizes that these things are so. And so the question is, is why haven't we tackled them? Uh, why are we working on increasingly marginal aspects that don't even deal with any of the significant issues? And this is something I've wrestled with for a number of years, is why we're in the situation that we're in. And I'm going to put forward to you what I think are three reasons. They're, they're, they're actually manifold um, reasons for this, but sort of three reasons to start with that I think might be appropriate uh, for this group. Uh, the first one is just a very basic assumption. This affects the way that we do energy analysis. Everything is building-centric. You know, we, do, we, we, we treat a building as if it's an energy system. Uh, the fact that we even have a concept about zero energy buildings shows an incredible misunderstanding of how energy systems actually behave and how building systems behave. The thought that we should do an energy balance around a building, uh, you know, gets us back to this sort of building centricity uh, that neglects the way these systems behave. A building is a unit of private property. Uh, private property does not match neatly uh, with any type of energy system uh, that I'm familiar with. You know, the issues of things like uh, photovoltaics on buildings, I've spent a great deal of time uh, in the U.S. Uh, trying to fight this, which someone might think is strange for someone who's involved in sustainable architectural design. But so many of the reasons for doing this misunderstand the way that photovoltaic systems behave, how they wish to behave, how they wish to be located, and how, what uh, they should be used for, which is for direct current. And our idea of having it sort of plug in, uh, erase the load of a building, uh, I think misunderstands almost all of the advantages that you can get from a photovoltaic system, doesn't really take, uh, uh, misunderstands uh, the disadvantages of it, doesn't take into account some of the really great advantages uh, of doing that. The second thing is that our technologies in buildings tend to be designed for the building and not its occupants. And if you look at what we deal with in buildings and we look at the energy consuming parts of buildings, with the exception of medical facilities, laboratories, and certain types of industrial processes, these systems are only there for the human body. They're not building services. They're there only for the human body. And yet we design them to serve the building, presuming that if they serve the building, that they will indeed serve the body. And so we look at something like an HVAC system schematic. It's important for us to recognize that the type of the system that we use today, or primarily use today, the dilution-based system, uh, the last major patent was 1911 on that. Uh, we switched major control schemes in 1973, but fundamentally unchanged uh, as we look at that. And so we're caught with things like this is just a, a, a brief dump of data from one day of a small part of the 450 points uh, that are monitored on a building on campus. Uh, I often hear again and again how we need to train building operators to operate buildings better. At the same time, we need to train occupants how to behave properly in buildings. Uh, I think the real question is, is that we really do have the wrong kind of system when it's moved into this type of category where we're overwhelmed with information, we're overwhelmed with data, and a lot of it has to do precisely with this, that we have a Rube Goldberg cascading uh, chain of events in order to control a temperature in a space that has almost nothing to do with the actual need or relationship to the human body. And the third thing are the tools that we have. Uh, the types of tools that we have, because we don't lose this building centricity, that we do think that the building sort of operates as the center and the object of what we're trying to analyze, we tend to sort of simulate that which we know. And so we treat a building as if it's some type of homogeneous system that's bounded by a material entity or, or bounded by material artifacts, um, our facade or our envelope, and we look to simulate what happens inside. The way that we do that means it privileges the idea of a conservative volume, as if the building itself can be uh, analogized but also simulated as if uh, it's either a large conservative volume or a series of segmented uh, 
conservative volumes. And just to sort of show you um, the fallacy of this, uh, this was a, a project that I had, um, uh, now it's, it's quite some time ago, it was in the, uh, the late 1990s, so it was right after the Sistine Chapel was cleaned, and I got a call from John Sherman, who at the time was the scientific director of the, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the uh, was a, the director of the scientific committee for the Sistine Chapel. Uh, he's the man who was responsible for deciding uh, what the color should be after the cleaning. Uh, he called me because after they installed the new state-of-the-art HVAC system, within two weeks they'd already seen soiling on the walls. And they were a little alarmed at that. They were hoping to wait another 400 years for cleaning, uh, not five months uh, before they'd have to clean again. And so when I dug into this, I found that um, all the initial thermal studies that had been done of the chapel, including this computational fluid dynamic model uh, that had been done uh, to help them design uh, the HVAC system of it. And what you can see in this, what, what the thermal analysis what the conclusion of the thermal analysis had been when it was completed uh, in the late 1980s as they were sizing or planning for the system was that, you know, the, the, the chapel was a series of different types of thermal environments um, all the way throughout, top to bottom, uh, across the plan, uh, day to night, uh, season to season. And so the objective came, it needs to all be homogeneous. If we could just make it homogeneous, clear temperature all the way, clear, you know, no change in temperature profile, no change in humidity profile. That's the air environment that we have to have in this chapel. So the HVAC system was designed to do this, um, and all the diffusers uh, were placed so that they were hidden by this upper part of the railing. Uh, the result was is that uh, by presuming that homogeneity, uh, that Again, this sort of idea of a giant conservative volume was the most important thing. What they had done is they stripped the laminar boundary layer away from the walls before when they allowed the air to be dis, um, you know, heterogeneous, uh, when they allowed the walls to drive the condition, uh, they had a, a sort of a much longer, I don't know if I have a, this is a pointer. They had a much a uh, higher laminar uh, boundary layer uh, moving along the wall surface and uh, much lower turbulence, and turbulence is the problem when you're dealing with soil. Uh, but the, what they did when they uh, went to this homogeneous system, this high velocity system, they completely stripped away the laminar boundary layer and the result is they were just slamming soil against the walls. It was, an, again, an easy thing to fix, but it was having to fix the conception you know, the image of what the environment should be uh, before one could actually fix the, uh, the technology uh, that was involved in that. And so, given that I think these are sort of the three general areas, the thought that uh, we treat the building as being um, an independent uh, or analogous to uh, an energy system, the thought that uh, we tend to think of it as being a conservative volume, and then on top of it, all of our systems are designed for the building and not for the actual human need within it. How do we move forward from this? And so here's some thoughts that I have that I hope would be appropriate for this group on how we might begin to move forward. Uh, first of it is thinking about disintegrating systems at the indiv individual building. As long as we're thinking building centricity, as long as we're thinking the building as uh, an isolated uh, independent unit where we do an energy balance around it, we demand integration. We want everything to be integrated together because it's all part of that packet of private property and we want that packet of private property to represent, be a microcosm of everything that happens around it. We need to start realizing that many of these systems belong at very different scales, behave at different scales, are governed at different scales and are very different types of phenomena that don't neatly integrate together. And what you want to do then is optimize them at phenomenological uh, scales and not at operational scales. And so just even starting uh, briefly with uh, looking at energy supplies to buildings, uh, understanding that uh, a given current alternating current system is going to optimize uh, on a regional level. Uh, to give you an example, I live outside of New York City. 
um, our alternating current system is optimized in two different points throughout New England. It doesn't matter if you're a house with a photovoltaic panel or you're a nuclear plant, you're optimized at the same two points. It's all bled in and decided there. So decisions have to be made understanding how that larger grid operates. Uh, I'm very interested in seeing DC systems. There's a lot of work going on in DC systems. We have an opportunity to look at deploying them at a much smaller level, and I think there's some incredible possibilities for buildings coming from that. The only thing that we can look at at building scale is thermal mass. Um, we can't look at thermal water or geothermal systems from a building scale that really belongs to different types of geological constructions, again, not something governed by building scale. So part of it is understanding the systems and that they occur at these different scales. The phenomena themselves are much smaller. Uh, with the exception of uh, uh, higher Reynolds number type of uh, convection, uh, everything else exists at much smaller than building scale, much, much smaller than surface scale. Uh, you know, the biggest thing that we really deal with when we're talking about the phenomena that affect the human body will be light at the micron scale. Uh, but everything else is going to be dealt with and is governed at a scale that's much smaller. We like to make decisions at building scale, and decisions at building scale can have a deterministic impact on the phenomena at this smaller scale, uh, but it's not the scale at which one does that optimization. You know, so for example, we think about you know, common approaches to daylighting, which look at orienting uh, surfaces in relationship to where the sun is. Again, that's uh, taking a very macro approach to what is a micron scaled behavior. I can get any light I want from any orientation I choose at any level I choose just by using a refraction film. Uh, and that's understanding the behavior, working on the behavior, and not trying to move the building or orchestrate the building in order to orchestrate the behavior. Uh, you know, I also think my, my primary area, I do a lot of work in light, but my primary uh, background is in fluid mechanics. And I've always been interested in the fact that we've not employed fluid mechanics at the same level or same uh, depth that other uh, fields have employed it at. And a lot of it is because of our image of what we should be modeling in a building. So I share this uh, idea here. Uh, it comes from David Boswell Reed uh, from 1844. It's actually a nonsense drawing. This is not physically possible, this particular behavior. Yet most people would assume it's possible. Most people think that if you have opening set like this, this is what's going to happen uh, within that. It's not a physically possible behavior. But because we have an image of how air moves, then we demand that our tools uh, replicate that image. And this sort of like compounds all of it because not only do we want the tools to replicate the image that we have, uh, but we still continue to think that it is the building that determines that. And this is a particular phenomenon that exists at a scale much, much smaller than that. And so just to give you an example, this is a, a series of studies that I did um, uh, after the Sistine Chapel work of trying to use a resistance wire to create different types of thermal environments in a space. Uh, this was modeled, I don't know how many CFD models are in there, but uh, the grid size was every 10 nanometers. Uh, so this did take seven days on a supercomputer to do each, each simulation. But that's the only level at which you can look at this particular phenomenon. Anything else is doing an approximation. And this is sort of where in, in uh, uh, actually in support of what Tristam said this morning, who was talking about the fact that we sometimes model it at too small of a scale. I think we model it too small of a scale when we're looking at systems. Uh, we don't model it at, at small enough scale when we're looking at phenomena. Phenomena have to be understood at the scale at which they occur. Anything else is a series of approximations. And if the approximations are good, one needs to understand uh, what their limits are, but not assume that an approximation is actually going to teach you much or you're going to learn much uh, from that phenomenon. And of course, this relates very much now to this tautology that we have uh, for technologies. Uh, if we look at homogeneous systems, the type of systems that we have in buildings, which are dependent upon diluting air, uh, we're stuck with the things that we have on the left. If we can understand uh, the fact that I only need to shift a heat transfer coefficient in one location, that I only need to modify a boundary layer uh, near a body, I can start moving to technologies on the right. 
What's very interesting, and I'm not doing this in a relative, I'm, this, I, the, what I'm sharing with you is an absolute, is that each one of the devices that you see up here moves the same quantity of heat in the same time frame. It's just that only the ones that we use in buildings do so in the most inefficient way possible. Uh, these can't sort of create homogeneous air. Only those can create homogeneous air. But these can allow one to actually make these tiny and very discreet moves that we need to make uh, in order to actually control phenomena, as opposed to sort of avoiding that type of control by making everything homogeneous. And so along those lines, this thought of can we use tools to understand and characterize phenomena, not just to simulate and analyze performance? And this is sort of where a little bit of history uh, might be important. Um, I worked for NASA and was part of the team that developed uh, NASTRAN, uh, which was the first finite element uh, structural analysis program. And um, at the time, what we were trying to do with, with NASTRAN was to get away from doing destructive testing of satellite units. Uh, the only way we could see how a satellite would perform uh, would be to take it through a series of destructive tests. So we always built a separate satellite in order to take it through those tests, very exhaustive tests that we took it through in order to replicate launch loads. Not only were we trying to see if it made it through launch, but there's so many delicate instru instruments that fold out on booms, you're trying to make sure that you don't lose, you know, even um, a millimeter of uh, uh, a millimeter of positioning once things start folding out on booms. So that's what the whole testing sequence was done for. Uh, back then, and this is now, you can, you can imagine back then in the early 70s, uh, this was something that cost a million dollars a test unit uh, to do. They really wanted some type of computational tool uh, to allow them to at least do a good part of that testing uh, before they started, uh, uh, or, or to minimize the amount of physical testing they needed to do. Uh, we started working on uh, developing the code uh, for NASTRAN. And while we were working on it and testing in different things, uh, this project uh, came up, which was this joint project between NASA and the European Space Research Organization, uh, where two satellites were going to be coupled together. Uh, the problem that we had was that we only had our satellite. And so we were not going to get the ESRO satellite in time to do the kind of exhaustive testing. So we had to really um, fast track uh, our development of NASTRAN in order to use NASTRAN to do the primary analysis of this. And for those of the, you who do structural analysis, uh, to realize that we didn't have the second satellite, um, that we did all of our structural analysis of the relationship with it with a model that had 182 grid points, two satellites a coupling, um, and 45 degrees of freedom. Uh, it's kind of astonishing uh, to think about that now. You probably wouldn't even look at uh, part of a boom uh, in that way now to think that two satellites coupled together would be looked at at this particular level. Uh, and part of it was, and this was a great learning for me as a, as a young engineer, uh, was working with a really incredible group of very brilliant uh, engineers who understood what we call orders of magnitude. And everything was done by orders of magnitude and sort of searching for what the persistent behaviors were going to be or what the governing phenomena were going to be. And you could sacrifice the rest of it as long as you were aware of focusing on what the governing phenomena. And this was a great lesson for me because as I think about going forward and how one deals with what we simulate as things have become incredibly complex, if one can think about this idea of orders of magnitude, identifying persistent behaviors, letting go of the rest of it. The data won't tell you what's going on. It's actually the knowledge that you have to go forward and identifying the key phenomena is really the thing that begins to matter. Uh, but this relates to, I have a, a couple of projects with some of my former doctoral students, uh, this sort of way of thinking, what is the phenomenon uh, and as, as opposed to simulating a situation? Uh, work on urban heat island, uh, the prevailing wisdom on urban heat island is that if you want to avoid an enhanced urban heat island effect, buildings have to be separated twice as far apart as they are high. It's really not a terribly reasonable thing uh, for the typical city to think that you could do this. Uh, this issue of spacing has to do with the field of view, basically the sky view that you have. 
And one of the interesting things that this particular student, Nari Fenyuatana, who now runs the Atelier 10 office in Bangkok, um, discovered as she was doing this work was that uh, uh, you can extend a virtual sky view uh, simply by using uh, a reflective coating on the top two floors of a building. So an imperceptible reflective coating on the top two floors, which extended the virtual sky view uh, for heat exchange, was the same as moving buildings. So simulating urban heat island uh, at the micron scale uh, in order to avoid making a macro scale type of modification is exactly the right kind of match a phenomenon uh, to impact. Uh, this is from uh, Adriana uh, Lira, who um, uh, was working on how to get uh, light, I think it was around 450 nanometers, into the periphery of the eye, uh, actually working in a team uh, with uh, Nari, uh, because they both were dealing with micron-scaled phenomena. One's doing micron-scaled phenomena for urban heat island, another one's doing micron-scaled phenomena for the retina of the eye. Uh, but this is one that I think was alarming to us, uh, some of the, the things that Adriana discovered. Uh, we teamed up with Roy Glauber, uh, who uh, received the 2006 Nobel Prize in Physics uh, for his research in photonics. He looked at all the algorithms uh, that were being used to do lighting simulation and said that all of them uh, that he looked at uh, were calculating the material interaction of light uh, incredibly incorrectly. So he rewrote algorithms uh, for her in order to uh, do the appropriate uh, simulation. And that was a little startling for us. We hadn't even questioned uh, any of the algorithms uh, for doing lighting design from that. Does it matter if you're doing gross lighting design? I don't mean gross, I mean macro lighting design, no. But if you're actually really interested on the interaction with the retina, which fundamentally is what we do care about, uh, then uh, it can't, it, it wasn't, uh, was unable to deal with that. And then uh, a last student uh, worked with a visual psychologist and uh, within that, and this is sort of I think an incredible question to think about for the future of uh, what one begins to simulate, uh, he actually built a physical model uh, to show people that smaller apertures provided better light. It do they don't provide more light Larger apertures give you more light. Smaller apertures give you uh, the appearance of more light. How do you begin to simulate for the appearance of more light as opposed to physically more light on that? And this was all done through, uh, this was actually a physical test unit that was built uh, in Kuwait. Uh, and I included this on the, uh, the website that I sent everyone, but this was also done with the visual psychologist. Uh, who talked very much about how they test uh, retinal interaction with light. And so um, I had a couple of students who built uh, these head pieces uh, that uh, we controlled uh, density of light using fiber optics and, and addressable LEDs, controlled the density of light and the distribution of light. And you'd put on this headpiece and you would, you would swear you were inside of a great hall or you could feel as though you were in a tiny room. It was very easy to manipulate that. And I think these are incredible opportunities for us to move forward, and it's this idea that it's no longer about the artifactual surface, it's really about the phenomenological surface that we create, and those are, in many cases, virtual surfaces as opposed to actual surfaces. So one of the greatest potentials that I see. So, in the last piece of this, can we begin to develop some type of cross-sectoral, multi-domain method that takes you across these different things? Not about simulating a building system and going even deeper into that, but understanding where some of these intersections occur, and perhaps in a, in a uh, sort of a most pragmatic way. Uh, you know, for all we talk about for green roofs, cool roofs, photovoltaics on roofs, most of those analyses project what the larger impact would be uh, but do a very detailed comparison of the heat load or the heat impacts in the building. Uh, what we really need to understand is how working with different types of roofing materials uh, affects a much larger scale of infrared reflectivity. Begin to understand that interaction. I'm looking for the tool that would allow me to understand how making a roofing decision uh, affects a larger regional albedo. 
Uh, things like understanding how the body really does interact thermally with space. It's through a very narrow boundary layer. We can manipulate in a couple of different ways close to the boundary layer, modifying certain intersections with the boundary layer, or working with radiation. Uh, but none of it really uh, addresses or thinks that we should be dealing with it from the standpoint of a homogeneous air system. There's ways of making very discrete moves. But ultimately, that's what you want to be doing with the body. It's discrete for the, for the eye. It's going to be discrete for the body. But understanding that as we make these types of moves, whatever energy we use in order to make these types of moves, that we also have to understand its larger impact, not the impact on how much energy I spend at the building to make that move for that individual, but what the larger impact of that's going to be, particularly on whatever regional energy system that I am tying into that. So for my, my last slide on this, and I have 36 seconds, I'm really proud of myself. <laughs> my last slide on this, the way we need to start thinking about what is multi-domain and cross-sectorial is understanding the ultimate need for all of these systems occurs at the level of the body, really beginning to understand the body, what its interactions are. The place that we take action, however, we don't take action at the body level. It's very difficult to take action at the body level. We do take action through the things that we build, through the material artifacts that we install. So we understand the actions there, even though the need occurs at a much smaller level. The impact of that action is something we're going to see on these larger systems in a fairly uh, relatively direct way. And of course, the consequences of that are the things that are longer term. And so ultimately, what we're looking for is to find what those strategic points of intersection are between where it is physically, financially, and operationally possible to take action, uh, but where it's also, you know, uh, phenomenologically optimal, physically and phenomenologically optimal to take action. We're looking for that as an intersection. It's not the building. The building might be the place that is a convenient unit in, in order to operate in. That's not ever going to be the place where it's physically and phenomenologically optimal to take action. Nevertheless, it's a unit we work in, so we've got to find what are those strategic decisions that we make along the way on that. And anyway, it just turned zero. So thank you very much.